Tonight, he knows when you've been sleeping and he knows when you're awake, and so do the cops. See their Christmas card reminders to potential criminals to be good to, for goodness sake. And an update on those two missing teenagers who vanished in New York five days ago. Good news and bad news. And then, you can review a hotel, a restaurant, and pretty much any service, but what about a hitman? Welcome to Austin, Texas. And Cousin Eddie swears he wasn't hired to shoot Alex Murdoch in the head. So why did Alex pay him almost $3 million? And maybe another good question, where's the money now? It's all ahead on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. It is Tuesday, December 14th, just over a week till Christmas. And to start the show off, right, we have some Christmas stories for you. Christmas crime stories, actually, to be exact, because for some reason there are some people among us who just don't seem to share the same holiday DNA as the rest of us. And tonight we have an all-star Yuletide panel to figure out why that is. You all know News Nation's Brian Enton. He is way ahead of the curve on this, covering the surge of smash and grab crimes across the country. Sheriff Mike Chitwood of Volusia County, Florida, knows a thing or two about bad guys. And former prosecutor Susan Violin, she's good at putting them away. And I don't mean hot toddies. I want to begin with Brian Enton. Brian, another smash and grab robbery. This time, though, the victim was a little guy, not one of those big box stores that could probably, you know, uh, handle the loss. This is one of the, you know, the mon pa kinds. Yeah, Ashley, you know, the, the big box stores like Target behind me, they get a lot of the attention with these smash and grab videos. But this is a small business in Miami. Uh, it's called Token Sneakers. It's a luxury sneaker shop. The owner actually took out a small business loan over the last year to finally open the shop. It was his dream. And he has been hit not once, but twice. He boarded up after the first smash and grab. He had boards on the doors and windows, and they got in again. Listen to what the owner told me. It was a little bit disappointing because, you know, we, you know, this wasn't handed to us. You know, we really worked years and years to be able to get to this point. I mean, I've been selling sneakers since what, 2007, 2008. So we're, we were finally at a point where we were able to afford um, our own brick and mortar location. So just for someone to try to take something that we worked so hard for. And uh, what made that, that man, Myrick, so mad also on top of all of that is that one of these guys who hit him uh, was actually out on bond when he committed the burglary. Ashley? So uh, then they've caught them? Uh, they've caught the guys that did this, this most recent one? They caught them very, very quickly, actually. Police were very, very quick to respond. He had an alarm system that went off. Uh, but he says that several of them are now out on bond again for the second time. So... Are they going to be able to recover the stolen goods? You catch the guys, but the guys sometimes can fence that stuff or get rid of it real quickly. Are they going to get the stuff back? Well, this was really good police work in the second incident. Uh, Miami police, again, quick to respond. They knew the shop because they'd been broken into before. They chased the car right in that area. The stuff was still in the trunk, and he says he was able to get all of the goods back. So that's the good news. Okay, so I'm going to bring in Susan Filan and uh, Sheriff Chitwood on this one. Susan, first to you, uh, these guys are out on bond and they still come back and commit crimes. They're not even adjudicated yet on the last round and they're already... So I, here's the question. Any chance they'll get bond on the second? Yes, here's the problem. COVID has pretty much sent a message to criminals, go for it, because it's very difficult to hold people pre-trial detention on bond with this pandemic. So people who would normally be held on bond are getting released and people are not having to post bonds at all. And some people aren't even getting sent to the, the jail. They're just getting released right from the arrest. I think this is a pandemic phenomenon. And I think that yes, they'll make bond again. The likelihood of going to prison once they're adjudicated is lower again because of COVID. And that's, that's the tragedy for law-abiding citizens, Ashley. Who are the majority of us, which makes my blood boil. Sheriff Chitwood, the old expression used to be crime doesn't pay, but it kind of feels like with what Brian and Susan are saying, crime does pay. Absolutely. These Grinch 
scumbags cost the American taxpayer $50 billion a year. 12 to 15 percent of small business owners like this poor gentleman, they have to fold. They can't absorb the loss. And for us to rubber stamp these uh, dismissals and, oh, it's only a victimless crime, that's BS. We, we, we can't have it. We cannot have it. Yeah. It, well, OK, so I think uh, I am as angry, I think, as the folks who are watching when you hear about this. And that might set your uh, perspective for this next story, because I'm going to take you across the pond to jolly old England, home to uh, Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie. But the story I'm going to tell you is a heck of a lot more Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, police in Northampton, a town about 60 miles from London, have launched a program there called Operation Crooked. Uh, where they mail Christmas cards to known and suspected burglars. Uh, it's pretty funny, actually. On the front is a Santa. Hi, how are you? But it says, uh, he knows where you live. And then when you flip the card over, the words say, so do we, with a photo of a police officer. Um, they say that the card is designed to remind potential crooks that burglaries will not be tolerated. So Sheriff Chitwood, it makes me chuckle and I think it's funny and all the rest, but it does seem a little bit weird, almost like the movie, the Tom Cruise movie Minority Report, where you're going after criminals before they actually commit a crime. They may have done something in the past, but this is like, you know, one of those, I'm watching you, we think you have the propensity. Does that seem right to you? Uh, God love the Brits. I mean, they gave us money, Python's Flying Circus and so many other great uh, comedies. The bottom line is if the judges and the prosecutors can't put these people in jail, you can send out all the cards you want. If there's no consequences, what do they care? I mean, that's a pretty good point. I was trying to think through it, Susan Filan. Um, we know where you live, and I'm wondering if that could be tantamount to sort of harassment or stalking or anything. Is there anything to that, or is this completely harmless? Oh, I think it's fine. I actually like it. I think that some people commit crimes for attention, and this is giving them attention in advance. We know where you live. We've got eyeballs on you. I also think if you're actually thinking about it and you think, gosh, they know where I live, they, they know it's me, they knew to send me a card, they know I'm a thief, you might think twice about maybe not stealing, but not stealing in that particular town where those cops are watching you. I like it, Ashley. I mean, I, I like the idea. I keep thinking about Americans, and there's always some objection somewhere to something like that. Brian Anton, do you think that's the kind of program that could work here? You've been face-to-face -face in the last couple of weeks covering the story with officers of the law and bad guys and then victims of crime as well. Do you think this has a chance, this kind of uh, behavior, this kind of action by police? I think it's possible because all of the police officers and the sheriffs that I've spoken to over the last week have said so many of these guys are repeat offenders. They are serial uh, burglars. I mean, this isn't like a one or two time shoplifter kind of thing. So if they're doing it over and over again, they send them a reminder like that. I, I think that could be a good idea. OK, well, what do you think about this, Brian? The, the London police. And again, I told you before that this other one was in Northampton, about 30 miles away or 60 miles away. So London, we all know London, uh, they were not to be outdone. And apparently they decided to launch their own kind of Christmas crime fighting tool. It's called the 12 Days of Christmas Advent Calendar. You know what an advent calendar is, right, folks? It's the thing you, you poke one out, you get a candy or something with each day. But on the <laughs> On this one, every window opens and is a photo of a fugitive and a description of their alleged crime. Uh, Brian, I know this is like almost deliciously delightful to see this because, you know, if, if you're a, you know, if you're a fugitive, to hell with you. You deserve as much press as possible. I suppose that's pretty harmless here with the, the, the folks in crime fighting that you've been talking to, Brian. Yeah, especially if they're a fugitive. I mean, the more attention, the better, right? If they're on the run, hand out the calendar, post it on social media. Uh, for sure, I, th I think that's a great idea. Sheriff Chitwood, are you getting some ideas? Are you scratching something down in your notebook as we do this segment? I am. I would put a stocking stuffer under there. If you poke the, uh, the picture and this knucklehead pops up, hey, there's $1,000, $2,000, whatever it may be to help you toward Christmas, to help us make sure he gets three hots and a cot, love it. I, I love that idea too. So just checking, Susan, uh, you're a prosecutor. You're also really smart when it comes to law. No issues here, right? They, they, this is fair game. The, the government can send out these kinds of uh, publications without any kind of, you know, legal uh, exposure, right? Like you're not destroying this person's chance for getting a job down the road. 
No, I mean, you can post a want ad uh, poster in the post office. You can post it in a public place. You can post it online. This is absolutely no different. I don't see any issue at all with this. And um, when you're talking about First Amendment rights, at least in this country, what First Amendment right do you have not to be spoken about in this criminal context if you are, in fact, a fugitive and a suspect? I think yeah. it's a great idea. Ash, I love it. I like these, too. And it is hard to defame somebody who's wanted uh, by the law. OK, <laughs> I'm going to move on to this this next Christmas. I'm always trying to be careful, though, right? Because everything sometimes seems like it's OK. And then there's this little hitch to it. But in this case, it looks like, you know, clear to go. Sheriff Chitwood, like I said, get your people on it. Next story comes to us from California. It's all about holiday shopping, uh, a shopping spree with a twist. Woman there has been charged with grand theft after allegedly stealing thousands of dollars in clothing and designer goods. And we are not talking about like a sweater and a purse. We're talking about more than a quarter million dollars worth of shoplifting booty. And here's how it worked, the police say. Uh, this lady, her name is Ekaterina Zarkova. She was spotted allegedly stealing clothes from a Nordstrom rack. Uh, and the people who did it, uh, it was a division of the California Highway Patrol called the Organized retail theft task force who knew that chips had that but they do and that group arrested her two days later what do you think happened she posted out twenty thousand dollars bail got out of jail uh it turns out when they served the warrant to her this was her apartment this is what they found there look at everything there's not even room to walk around it's like a it's like a a hoarder of real new stuff three hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars worth of prada and Gucci and Jimmy Choo and you name it. They also found that her car was packed to the gills with luxury goods. Uh, apparently she had a device that altered those security tags that you find in the store. And then she also used the store's own shopping bags to walk around and then, you know, walk out pretty well undetected, the police say. So the allegation here is that she ripped off the discount stores and then resold all those amazing things to the, uh, all the fancy stuff, like the fancy goods, using those luxury online consignment stores. And you know them if you shop uh, for cheap, good stuff. She's gonna be arraigned on Feb 3, and she could be jailed for up to nine years. Sheriff Chitwood, $300,000 is not your average uh, shoplifter. This is like, this is serious. It looks like it's very well organized but very well organized by one person. Uh, actually, I think there's more involved in that. The fact that she has the tools to defeat the, uh, the security tags, they have an online process. I think CHP did a great job. There's a lot more digging into this. Again, this crime cost our economy $50 billion a year, and those losses are passed on to the American consumer. So, Susan, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, a lot of us girls talk about, we like our fancy bags. We do not like the multiple thousands that it costs to get one. So if you can find a cheap one, I mean, you, you go for it. The problem is, is you're, you're technically in possession of stolen goods, right? If you bought something from this lady and you're holding your pretty Gucci bag that was, you know, really inexpensive, are you a, are you a criminal? Yeah, you are. My father always said to me, if it's too good to be true, it's <laughs> too good to be true. Yeah, no, you can't. I mean, it's not hard. You can't do that. So I think you're as much in trouble as the person who's doing the theft. And here's what I think. I agree with the sheriff on this. She's definitely not acting alone. She's definitely part of a ring or a gang. And I bet her defense is going to be something like the gang made me do it or uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a battered woman by the gang and I didn't have my own free will. I can just see duress, coercion. I can just see that defense coming. But whether I buy it or not, it's a different story. I don't think she acted alone. And I do think the people that buy cheap stuff are, as, are, are in big trouble, too. And so should be. what so happened? Long. How big? So tell me how big. Like, she's facing nine years because she allegedly went into the stores, ripped everything. P.S. I love the fact that she doesn't just buy it from Nordstrom Rack and sell it. She's looking for the bigger spread, right? They're already pretty cheap at those stores. But if you, like, let's say someone who's watching right now is like, oh, dang, you know, I, I got something online, you know, uh, six months ago or, or last month and it was really, really cheap, uh, what could happen to them? Like, how bad could it be? Because, you know, you could understand that they, they don't know that it's stolen. They just think they got a good deal online. You're not in as big trouble as she is, obviously. I mean, it really, it kind of applies to the person that's standing at the back of a truck on the street buying stuff. I mean, there you 
should know or reasonably should know. I think if you mistakenly purchase something that you didn't realize, you thought it was used or you didn't realize, I think that's I think that's defensible and I think that's different. So I don't want to scare the viewers, but I do want to deter the viewers who think it's okay to stand at the back of a truck and buy cheap luxury goods that yeah, that's still you're an accessory, you're in trouble, not as much as the thief, but to a lesser degree. But still trouble is trouble and you don't want it. You don't need yeah. it. Forget it. Well I got a Merry I got Christmas, a good do deterrence. the right thing. Uh, if they find you, and clearly a lot of this stuff is done online, so you're easily trackable if you bought this garbage. Um, it's actually not garbage, it's just it's stolen goods. Uh, it will cost you so much more for a lawyer to defend your case. You'll, you'll probably not have a big issue, but you will be out way more than the cost of the bag <laughs> if you have to defend yourself in court against this. So, Brian, talk to but me about the deal. But you do have the, the right to because... cancel it for free if you can't afford it. That is true, that if you can't afford it, but they will know if you're, you know, buying Gucci bags online, you probably got some coin that's spare. Uh, Brian, you've been following this, like the idea of fencing these goods, and it's kind of an obvious number. Uh, if you're shopping and you see these particular deals, there, there's kind of a, a, a specific formula of the discount that you should be wary. I get it. That's the discount where I, it's probably fenced. Yeah, absolutely, Ashley. And we're not talking about used items. We're talking about brand new purses and designer clothes and razors. Razors are big because they're expensive in the store. Allergy medicine. If you are buying new items off of Amazon or Facebook Marketplace uh, and it's 50, 75, 80% off, there is a very, very good chance it's stolen and all of the law enforcement experts that I've spoken to said, uh, by doing that, you are fueling the demand. You are clearly contributing to the problem. Yeah, 50 to 75 percent off. That that doesn't happen. That ain't that ain't normal. So buyer beware uh, of what you buy, and then buyer beware because you could be part of the problem. Okay, got a final Christmas story. Uh, it's a crime story that comes to us from New York City. Since you're probably shopping a lot right now, folks, uh, you may not notice this. But a whole bunch of people have been getting credit card bills for credit cards they don't even have. And now we think we might know why. It turns out their trusty postal carrier may not have been quite so trusty. Four postal workers in New York were busted for stealing more than a thousand brand new credit cards from the mail that they were supposed to be delivering. A total of seven people allegedly part of this scheme. And let me explain to you how it worked. The postal carriers would pocket the mail when they could feel a credit card inside that envelope. So it's supposed to be going to the person. Instead, it does not. This happened in Manhattan and Brooklyn, and it even happened as far away as Virginia. So the postman would then take that card and pass it to a ringleader, and the ringleader would then go and buy all those high-end, expensive, luxury, fancy goods that the ringleader would then resale uh, for cash and then split it all up. Everybody would get their cut. Ocean's 14. The purchases were made at stores like Hermes and Chanel and Louis Vuitton. The seven suspects were indicted last week. They were released without posting bail. That was easy, Sheriff Chitwood. I mean, without even posting bail, they get out. Honestly, like, what's the downside of crime if it's that easy? There is none, Ashley. We just talked about this for the last couple of minutes. You know, you steal $300,000 worth of goods, you're ROR. You know, you work for the federal government, you steal credit cards and cash out of Christmas cards, you're ROR. So what is the downside here? At the end of the day, you're gonna get probation, maybe. Uh, but remember something, every uh, profession hires from the human race and every part of the human race is flawed. So when you put stuff in the mail, you gotta think about that, whether it's cash, a gift card, what a check, whatever, you gotta be cognizant of who's on the other end of that. So Susan, um, last I checked, that is actually not a small crime. If you're stealing from the mail, mail fraud is a federal crime and identity theft, which I'm guessing this is as well because you're making the purchases under that guy's name. These are serious crimes with serious time. And when you talk federal crime, you do almost all the time. So what are these guys likely facing for this kind of crime? I can't answer that without knowing the amounts involved in the number of counts, I'm sorry. But what I can tell you is that when the feds arrest you, you're done. Federal prosecutions stick almost all of the time. You're correct, Ashley. You do all your Fed time. This is a federal offense, and this is very, very, very serious. And I don't think 
the judges would take this lightly. I think because again, it's the pandemic, I think it's really difficult to incarcerate people pre-trial detention, but I don't think that's the same case post-trial conviction. Yeah, 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 you bet that. Um, and then you know, the other thing is, is the feds, like you said, uh, I, roughly a 90 to 95% conviction rate, if I'm mistaken, right, Susan? That's right. And don't like forget, that. most people plead out once they see the evidence against them. Very few cases go to trial. So the conviction rate is especially high because of that. Once you're faced with the evidence, you're like, oh, yeah, good point. Real quickly, Brian, are the consumers who get slapped, like all of a sudden they're like, I don't have this credit card and what the heck is this bill? Are they on the hook for the charges? Uh, no, that's the good news. I mean, first of all, don't pay the bill. If you notice something on your, your bill that, that you didn't charge, like a Louis Vuitton bag or the whole list you gave there, all these people have such good taste, by the way, uh, don't pay the <laughs> bill. Uh, if you don't pay the bill, obviously, then you can report it to your bank as fraud and you won't be on the hook. Okay, well, that's the best news out of this particular cri uh, Christmas crime segment. Uh, Brian Anton, Sheriff Mike Chitwood, and Susan Filan, I love you three. Merry Christmas to you, and thank you for doing this. Merry Christmas, Ashley, you and your family and your viewers. And happy oh, holidays, so everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Happy holidays to the viewers as well. All right, so uh, coming up. The parents of two 15-year-olds. Remember those two missing for four days in Manhattan? They made a desperate plea for their return home right here on our show last night. And tonight, we have an update. And there is good news and there is bad news. That's next. Uh, since it's the holiday season, I've got this question for you. What do you get for the person who has everything? How about a hitman? <laughs> and if you're trying to pick the very best one, check out the five-star review that one security company got for its services. Quote, Spear Tip is very professional and on top of it. They get the job done in an expedited time. Couldn't imagine using anyone else. <laughs> Not kidding. Eric Mond was apparently delighted with the service that he got from the alleged hitmen that he hired. He's the grandson of a Texas automotive tycoon, and he now stands accused of paying three quarters of a million dollars to kill his former mistress along with her ex-boyfriend because that pair was going to tell his wife about his affair with that lady. It's part of the evidence against Mond included the company's uh, response to the five-star review. This would be the alleged hitman's response. The owner of Spear Tip wrote, thank you for the kind words. Always a pleasure doing business with you. Always a pleasure working with you. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Eric Mond, the two alleged hitmen, and the owner of the security company are all facing double murder charges. Joining me now is Chris Swecker. He's the former assistant director of the FBI Criminal Investigations Unit. I could not write this on my most creative day, Chris Swecker. I can't even believe it. But is it ever common that a security company acts as a front for, for hitmen? Well, it, it does happen, Ashley. I mean, there is a small community of former military, the soldier or fortune types like this who will would do things for hire. They, they try to high, find high net worth individuals. Um, I, I'm not, this is not a terribly unusual scenario in terms of former military doing dirty tricks and, and committing crimes like this. I've seen it firsthand. It's crazy. And then to make this even crazier, apparently the allegation is, is that um, the, 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 the guy paid with a wire transfer. I mean, you know, three quarters of a million dollars with a wire transfer. Aren't you like, are you giving you red flag at $10,000? I mean, not three quarters of a million for heaven's sake. Yeah. Apparently this wasn't a Mensa group. Um, they, they made a lot of mistakes and obviously the, uh, the rating, on the website was was uh, sort of a, I, I hate to say it, but a comical add-on here. But this is a tragic set of circumstances. I mean, th these uh, these two individuals thought they were going to extort this rich individual, someone who had who was sort of a a, a, sci a sky out of a, a ri very rich in, uh, individual who owned a, ca a car dealerships, and they they completely misfired on this one. Somewhere in this group. And there were two unindicted individuals mentioned in the indictment. Somewhere in this group, somebody ratted on them. It's crazy to think that that couple that we just had up there, they're dead. But they were the, the, the catalyst in all of this because they were going to try to scam 
uh, the, the, the guy, Eric Mond, right? They, these two are going to scam Eric Mond and say, you were sleeping with this lady, uh, so we're going to tell your wife. And then he goes, you know, allegedly pretty criminal and, and, and goes and hires a hitman and they're dead. And the, the hitmen, uh, alleged to be, and, and Eric here, are all now up on double murder charges. What's super interesting here um, is that this guy, Mond, says, I never wanted them dead. They, usually that's what you hear. But he said, what I did was I paid the security company to travel from Austin to Tennessee to kidnap, threaten, and intimidate the couple. And the fact is that the couple ended up dead. So is that not your classic felony murder? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this could be a death penalty case. Now, if you read the indictment, which I pulled down today in the, out of the federal system, it does read that way, that, that he hired them to intimidate, if you will, and, and, he, and he apparently hire, hired the Keystone cops because they didn't just intimidate him, they killed him. They tried to kidnap the, the uh, guy one time and it was, quote, unsuccessful tried to approach the, the female victim at another point, and that was, quote, unsuccessful. So there were definitely two approaches early on, and then the fact that the, the, the male individual, the male victim, was killed right outside the apartment, possibly in plain view, tells me that something went bad as they were trying to kidnap him, and then they took her away and ended up having to kill her, I guess, to eliminate the witness. It's just, it's all so incredibly ugly. So I'm going to ask the controller if you could put up the picture of the three guys with the security company. It's the owner of the security company and the, the two alleged hitmen that he hired to, to do the job. See the guy in the middle named Byron Brockway? If this isn't already the dumbest story ever, that, a former U.S. Marine whom, you know, from whom you would expect a lot better, uh, he also decided to give a good review. Um, and he gave the Spear Company... Uh, that's Gilad's company, his boss. He gave him uh, a five-star review, too. So he's right underneath with a five-star review. I mean, it, it just, like I said, uh, Chris, you just can't write this stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll sure leave it can. at that. And I, I, I'm not so sure that this one's going to be an easy uh, rap to beat. But thank you, as always, for your, for your amazing work, your body of work over your career, and always for being great on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, still ahead. Uh, reunited, but it doesn't feel so good. Look at them. Will they look at each other? Look at each other? Will they? Will they? Will they? The jailed parents of the alleged Michigan school shooter, separated by two chairs filled by attorneys, in court today. And can you guess what they want from the judge for Christmas? That's next. Welcome back. Uh, the day after the alleged school shooter, Ethan Crumbly, made a virtual court appearance in Michigan, uh, his mom and dad, charged with helping him, walked into court in person for their court appearance. But they had to walk kind of slowly because they were shackled at the feet and at the waist. They are walking right by the camera. Uh, they wore jumpsuits. His was blue and hers was not blue. Hers was kind of a nice maroon color. They had to wear face masks and they seemed altogether miserable as the lawyers talked about a mountain of evidence against them and then agreed to push back a hearing on probable cause, which will probably now take place in February. Now you can see how far apart they are. You can see her knee going up and down pretty quick. They don't look at each other here. They couldn't sit together because the seats in between were reserved for their lawyers. But this is as close as they are going to be together over the holidays. Not surprisingly, their lawyers plan to file a motion to reduce their bond, which is now set at a half million dollars each. So that's a million bucks to get the both of them out. They want that lower. I guess they want to be home for Christmas. Um, considering that they were arrested in a warehouse after failing to turn themselves in, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. Flight risk could be a problem. So when the hearing was over, they each shuffled back to their separate cells where they will spend Christmas apart and New Year's and probably a whole lot of other days after that as well. All right, moving on to another state and a whole other series of alleged crimes in South Carolina. A judge has finally granted bail for Alex Murdoch, despite 12 brand new indictments against him. Yes, I said 12. 
And those indictments contain 48 new charges punishable by up to, you ready, 500 years in prison. If you are counting, that makes a grand total of at least 51 charges that Alex Murdoch now has to somehow figure out how to fight. Bail was set at seven million, full cash, which is more than prosecutors have even asked the judge for. And it's also one of the highest bails in South Carolina history. And Murdoch can't come close to making that bail, even if he had the cash, because you probably know this, his assets have been frozen. And then there's another twist that I gotta get you up to speed on. Remember Cousin Eddie? Uh, he supposedly was Alex's drug dealer, though he denies it. Uh, he was also the guy who Alex allegedly hired to shoot him in the head to get the insurance money for his son Buster. Uh, Eddie denies that too. But both of these guys agree that Alex did ask him to uh, shoot Alex in the head to, to get the insurance money. Now, it has come out that since about 2015, guy on the left, Alex Murdoch, paid guy on the right, cousin Eddie, whose real name is Curtis Smith, almost $3 million. Not with stacks of cash. It was actually well recorded by check. $3 million by check. Joining me now to follow these dollars, connect the dots, is Andrew Davis, who's the investigative reporter for WSAV in Savannah. I'm only smiling because tonight it just seems that there are so many dumb criminals out there. I just can't believe that Cousin Eddie would have said, I never received a dime from Alex Murdoch, when apparently th this was all done by, by check, which is really easy to, to track. Why all the money transfer? Uh, and maybe more importantly, where's all the money now, Andrew? That's a really good question because I've seen Cousin Eddie's house and it's uh, it's basically a trailer with some land. So wherever he's supposedly putting this money, he's not putting it in property that we know of right now. And that is a big question. Alec Murdoch says, I have no money. I can't post that jail, that bond that we're looking at with that $7 million. Yet at the same time, he's willing to make a settlement with Gloria Satterfield's family over four million dollars right there so my question is where does that money come from then and i think that's the question that the judge has too who came straight out and said i think there are going to be people on the outside who are willing to help you right now and that definitely concerns me he even said during that hearing as you looked at him that he's had an outpouring of support from people in the community or friends and family in this case so where is the money right now? Cousin Eddie certainly doesn't seem to have it unless he's putting it somewhere in his mattress or wherever else it may be. And Alec claims he has none, but he's also making amends with all these other people and willing to give them millions as well. There are so many, so many questions about, about all of that because $3 million, even if the drug allegations between Cousin Eddie and Alex Murdoch are true, you, $3 million, it, you, you can't eat that many opioids. I mean, that's, that's nuts. There's something very, very squirrely um, about that that figure. Um, again, all apparently the you know authorities say is traceable by check. So, so there's cousin Eddie's appearance. He was he was unhappy with that too because his hair was messy. He said uh, they said he'd been stuck in a cell all weekend. Uh, but Alex always always had a nice hairdo and you know was in and out within minutes. You know, posted bond and all the rest. So it's all it's all squirrely. So the charges that I, I'm looking at for um, for Alex. Hey, look, it's breach of trust, it's fraudulent intent, it's money laundering, it's obtaining property by, by false pretense, and, and those charges are in the multiples. But, Andrew, that's all interesting, but it's not the question that we're all waiting to have answered. These are all money charges on your screen, right? What about Maggie and Paul's death? We, we seem to be forgetting that Alex's wife and son were murdered months and months and months ago and I have heard nothing, not boo, about a suspect. What's happening with that part of this story, the biggest part of the story? Well, let's add to that Stephen Smith's murder, which was reopened from nearly five years ago because of what investigators say they found during the investigation to Maggie and Paul's murder, as well as the Gloria Satterfield case, which was also investigated and brought back up. SLED has not said a word in months about this case. They continue to piecemeal some information, 911 calls, whatever they can to try to keep this going without actually saying much. And in fact, the other interesting part recently is that their public information officer left or was put into a new position somewhere and they have moved someone else into that position. So is that because of what they have or have not been doing? 
or is it because they want someone else with mm. a different voice or situation in there? Mm. That's the question we all have. And so far, SLED is not willing to answer any of those questions. They go, it's an ongoing investigation. I've dealt with GBI, I've dealt with SLED and various other agencies. And this is the quietest I've basically heard anyone willing to not say anything at all about a case. Yeah, I want to know who killed these two. These two, uh, I mean, this is just a sickening crime, the way they were shot down at the dog kennel. All right, I've got 40 seconds left. But, uh, Alec, Alec did talk yesterday, um, but they wouldn't let us play the, the, the proceedings. So do you have any of those choice quotes about what he said? And I, again, about 45 seconds. Yeah, he, he really was conciliatory towards his own family, saying he was embarrassed by what happened. He felt like he let them down somewhere, didn't say anything about, though, his own victims. He does say he's going to make everybody whole and try to continue on from there. His quotes were simple. He was teary-eyed during the situation, but he was not really willing to apologize to any of these people that he stole millions and millions and changed their lives from. And I think the judge really looked at that and said, you need to be held in bond despite what you're saying about the fact that you are not suicidal anymore. That was just the worst day of your life, according to what Alex said. Now, suddenly, he though, this is even just as worse for him because he will not be getting out of bond anytime soon, according to what his lawyers are saying. Well, you know, he's a lawyer himself, so I'm sure that whatever he said, he chose his words carefully because lawyers know that what you say can and will be held against you. So, Andrew Davis, always lovely to see you. Thank you, and happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.